And now, enjoy a message from our lead pastor, Aaron Taylor. Well, today we're going to continue our series in the Beatitudes that we're calling Blessed or Blessed. And uh, the Beatitudes were the beginning of what was called a, a sermon that Jesus was preaching or that he sat down to teach, popularly called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he had been doing miracles of healing, and then he paused from those, and he went up and took his disciples up, and he sat down as a teacher, and he began to teach them. And he begins with these things called the Beatitudes, and they're really about being not about doing. How many know that there's a lot of things in the Sermon on the Mount that he's going to get to later on that are about how we ought to act or behave or do? But before we can do, how many know God wants to begin a, trans, a, a transformation in our hearts in the, way that we, uh, in the way that we are being? So they're called the be attitudes. Last week we looked at the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about how that is a promise for now in the present. It's not a will be, it's not something that's coming future, but it is now. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about Isaiah who had found a, himself in a position of being poverty, poverty in spirit. We're not talking about being poor Physically, we're not talking about a physical wealth or lack thereof in terms of poor, but rather our spiritual position when we get in the very presence of the Lord exposes us. And even someone like a prophet Isaiah who was very close to the Lord and who was hearing from the Lord when he had a vision of who God was and entered into the kingdom of God, all of a sudden he saw who God was and the very holiness of God and he said, woe is me, woe is me. And that is the place that we find ourselves in. The closer that we get to the Lord, the more we begin to get close to the Lord and see who he is in his holiness, the more it's revealed just how in poverty of spirit we are. It's a place of humility and it's the place to begin coming to the Lord empty-handed and admitting that we have need of the Lord. Now before we look at the list of Beatitudes again, I want to illustrate how the Beatitude that we started with and the Beatitude that we're going to look at today, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. I want to take a look today at two mountains. I want to contrast two mountains. One is seen in the Old Testament and one is here in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount. You see, in the Old Testament, God had, had uh, delivered Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, and then he led them to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And how many of you know what happened at Mount Sinai? God appeared to his people on Mount Sinai, and he began to give them the law or the Ten Commandments. God had revealed himself on that mountain. In fact, on that mountain, when God came down, his face was never seen, and the people kept at a distance. In fact, Scripture says that darkness descended, fire and smoke covered the mountain, trumpets were blasting, all of this according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, 11, and 12. In fact, the whole scene was so terrifying that it is said of Moses in Hebrews chapter 12, 21, I am trembling with fear. Now, how many know if Moses was trembling in fear, what would that mean for you and I? If Moses was trembling, what would that mean for you and I? But now we come in the New Testament to this place of the Beatitudes and the scene is completely different. God has invited, Jesus has invited his disciples on to this mount to sit down and begin to teach them. It is here that we see God face to face through Jesus Christ and he bids us to come. At Mount Sinai, God came down in a terrifying splendor and the people kept at a distance. Look at Exodus 20, 18 and 19. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and spoke, it says that they trembled in fear. And they said this, they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Friends, that's a terrifying place to be. It's absolutely terrifying, but here, different in the New Testament is the Son of God, who, in, in, in fact, he begins to go up on this mountain, and he begins to sit down with his disciples, and he invites them to come to him. Again, at, at Sinai, the no, they beg no further words to be spoken, but here, God does not speak in thundering words of condemnation, but rather wonderful words of blessing. He who would want to draw up a chair in this point and want to gather around and want to listen to what Jesus says as they're invited to come about a life that is truly blessed. 
And we've seen in Christ this astonishing statement, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as we talked about last week, that when we find ourselves in that position of humility, humility begs for the very presence of God, and the kingdom of heaven is the presence of God that we get to enjoy here now that is a glimpse of what we will experience one day in heaven. But we get a glimpse of it now, and it begins in poverty of spirit and humility. Yet poverty of spirit leads to something else. You see, they look to Jesus here in the, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. They look to Jesus for what they do not have. And in him, we find everything that we need. Now, how many of you are glad that the first beatitude begins with blessed are the poor in spirit? I don't know about you, but if it began with blessed are the pure in heart, I don't know how I would achieve that. If, if the starting point was the pure in heart, how would I get there? But it's here that God comes near to us and, 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 and God says, listen, I recognize you don't have what it takes. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said this about the Beatitudes. He said, a ladder, if it is to be of any use, must have its first step near the ground. And so the gospel reaches down to us in our humility, in our place of humility, our place of poor in spirit, and begins right there. But then we begin to move on to the second Beatitude. The blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But then it moves to the second rung of the ladder. And blessed are the poor in spirit ought to lead us somewhere. And here's what it leads us. It leads us to take the next step, which is Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What does Jesus mean by mourning? What is meant by this term, mourning? Aren't being blessed and mourning not compatible with one another? I don't, I don't see mourning and blessed. How is that compatible? Well, I want to explain this by sharing three types of mourning today. First of all, there's natural mourning. Natural mourning is defined as this. It's grieving over something given by God and then taken away. Something that has been given by God and then taken away. How many know that all that we have has been given by God? And so maybe it's someone that you love that passes away. You've had that moment. God allowed you to have that time with them and then they pass away. You begin to grieve naturally over that loss. In fact, it's a normal thing to do. Jesus, when his friend Lazarus had passed away, it says in John eleven thirty five 35 that he, he wept. He was mourning his dear friend Lazarus, even though he knew what was to come, demonstrates to us that when God gives something and then it is taken away, there is a mourning that takes place, a natural mourning of bereavement, which is a treasured gift because in there we do find that God does bring comfort to us. In the Beatitudes, Jesus speaks about qualities that we should proactively pursue, though, conditions of the heart that are loaded with blessing that we are to get so much of them in our lives as we possibly can. And so for that reason, I don't think that this is talking about spiritual or about natural mourning here. This is not the kind of mourning. I don't think that God wants us to pursue grieving and grief over the loss of something that God gives and then is taken away. I, I, as much as sometimes sorrow and bereavement can lead to other things, that's not something that we ought to pursue. So while it's a treasured truth that as the believer walks through a valley of the shadow of death or a valley of bereavement that God brings comfort, I don't think that, that this area of pursuing, like God talks about pursuing hungering and thirsting for righteousness and pure in heart, that this is something that God desires for us to pursue in terms of natural mourning. A second type of mourning is sinful mourning. Sinful mourning is different. It's different than natural mourning. It's actually very sinful. What do I mean by that? Well, it's pining after something that God did not give you. I want you to notice the contrast. Natural mourning is something that God gave and then take, had taken away. Job said that, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. But sinful mourning is grieving over something that God never intended for you to have. Never intended for you to have. Let me give you an example from the Old Testament found in 1 Kings chapter 21. In fact, there was a wicked king by the name of Ahab. He, had, he was the king of Israel. His wife was Jezebel. Ahab was a wicked king. And we see that Ahab, even though he was a wretched king, he, he was the leader at that time. And even though he had everything he wanted, all of a sudden he became obsessed with a particular vineyard. 
It was a vineyard that was owned by a man by the name of Naboth. And when Ahab went and said, listen, I want to buy your vineyard. I want to trade your vineyard or buy your vineyard. I want that. Naboth said, no, no, no. That is something that had been entrusted to me and in my family for generations. No, there's no amount of money. There's nothing you can give me. I'm not selling. And look at what happens. 2 Kings 21.4 shows Ahab's response to Naboth, and it says this. Ahab went home sullen and angry because of Naboth the Jezreelite, because he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. And so this is what Ahab did. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. There was something that God had not given Ahab that Ahab wanted, and Ahab was grieving over what God did not intend for him to have. Anytime we grieve over something that God never intended for us to have, that is a sinful type of mourning. When we covet after something that is not ours, when we are jealous after something that God did not give us, when we want to live a particular way and God says no, and we begin to grieve, that is sinful mourning, and it's the opposite of what brings blessing. In fact, Ahab went and, and, and murdered uh, Naboth because of that and took his vineyard, and it ended up bringing judgment upon he and his family. It was the very opposite of what God desires in terms of blessed. Thirdly, and this is where we're going to focus in today, it's spiritual mourning. A third type of mourning is spiritual mourning. And again, it involves sorrow over sins against God. Sorrow over sins against God. It's what Jesus describes as blessed. Spiritual mourning is godly sorrow that produces repentance, and it is blessed because it leads to life. It's blessed because it leads to life. In fact, A.W. Pink, the English Bible teacher, said this, the mourning for which Christ promises divine comfort is a sorrow over our sins with a godly sorrow. Paul speaks of this godly sorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, when he writes this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, and look at this, leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow brings death. In fact, the subject is of huge importance today because I think that we have been surrounded by a faith that bears no resemblance to biblical Christianity. I want to encourage you to follow me on this. If you've started to drift off or drift in your mind as sometimes happens when you're tired and you're here at the 9 a.m. service or you're watching online, I want to encourage you to come back to me because this is really, really important that we understand this contrast of biblical Christianity and what we see today with regards to faith. See, more than half of a century, true faith united a person to Christ has been replaced by an assent to or an agreement with certain beliefs. In fact, the substitution makes it easy for many people today to accept Christ without ever pursuing the holiness in their life that the Bible requires, that a Christian is called to. So in other words, we have a form of faith that leaves a person essentially unchanged and not worthy to bear the name of the Lord. Follow me. True Christianity involves more than just agreeing with certain beliefs and admitting that I'm a sinner and asking for forgiveness, friends. It involves repentance, for which the Bible says involves a change of direction. A change of direction. Isaiah described true, true repentance this way in Isaiah 55, 6, and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now look at this. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Do you see what seeking the Lord does? Seeking the Lord in repentance has to do with a forsaking. It's a forsaking the way of iniquity. It is forsaking the ways that dishonor God and calling on the name of the Lord involves not only forsaking sin but returning to God. God says to the sinner, you must forsake your way. That means leave it, abandon it. There's more than just admitting you're a sinner. It's not continuing in your sins any longer. The Bible calls for a decisive change of behavior, a change in direction in which a person quits sin and returns to the Lord. In the New Testament version, we see it in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And then look what it says. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. There's a problem in Christianity today. 
The problem is, is that Christianity has been reduced to a mental ascent, a mental agreement that I agree with certain beliefs. I agree that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I'd agree that Jesus rose from the dead. I agree that the the Bible is God's word. And we say that we agree, and and I agree, and therefore I, I agree that I'm a sinner. But the problem is, if we do not repent, we fall short of what the Bible talks about in terms of a transformation, a a spiritual mourning, a godly sorrow over our sin that leads us to forsake that way and to return back to the Lord. The follower of Christ who does not uh, depart from iniquity is missing something in their faith that is very dangerous. Faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. They belong inseparably together. God's people repent and then they believe and they repent. (laughs) They believe as they repent. Faith is the bond of a union between Jesus and for that reason it's a wellspring of repentance towards him. Listen to this quote by Alan Redpath, a seasoned preacher. He once said this, God has not promised to forgive one sin that you're not willing to forsake. Anybody say, ouch? Ouch. We're surrounded by a form of faith that's been reshaped to to accommodate our continual indulgence, resulting in a growing number of people that are still sinners but accept Jesus without ever having experienced true new life. They don't feel poor in spirit. They don't mourn over their sins. They don't submit meekly to God. And without these roots, there's no deep hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's no pure in heart. There's there's little mercy, purity, and peace. Live at a distance from the very blessing of God. So what does spiritual mourning look like? What does it look like? I want to talk to you about three distinguishing marks of spiritual mourning. First of all, spiritual mourning arises from humility arises from humility it it follows naturally becoming poor in spirit when i see that i don't have what it takes when i recognize like isaiah i say woe is me woe is me i'm a man of unclean lips i live among a people of unclean lips woe is me as i stand before the holiness of god and it reveals my sinful condition and the sinful state in which i live and the sinful culture in which i live i am in need of something and so i begin to repent and i look to god to meet my need Isaiah looked to God and God brought the coal and cleansed his lips it's a matter of repenting before God a humility of spirit leads to a spiritual mourning how do we hate what we used to love and love what we used to hate that's the problem sin is one of those things that is attractive to us if it wasn't attractive to us it wouldn't be tempting so how do we how do we love how do we hate what we love and love what we Hey, well, Charles Spurgeon is clear and helpful in his pastoral counsel here. The first advice he says that I give you is this, particularize your sins. Do not simply say, meaning in general I'm a sinner, it means nothing. Everybody says that, but ask God these questions. Am I a liar? Am I a thief? Am I a drunkard? Do I have unchaste thoughts? Have I committed unclean acts? Have I in my soul often rebelled against God? Have I often been angry without a cause? Do I have a bad temper? Am I covetousness or covetous? Do I love the world better than the world? Do I love this world better than the world to come? There's a good question. Do I neglect prayer? He says this, put the questions upon separate points and you will soon convict yourself much more readily than by taking yourself in the gross or in general as being a sinner. When you begin to personalize and begin to take a look and begin to say, no, this is the sin that I've committed against God. This is where I'm at. This is how I've sinned against God. Rather than in general, oh, I'm a sinner, but personally, what areas of my life am I falling short of the Lord? It brings us to a place of spiritual mourning. And it starts when we begin to open up the Bible. And when you open up the scriptures and give them entrance into your life, it begins to expose the dark areas of your heart. God will use what you read in his word to begin to expose those areas of your life so that you can come to him and you can begin to repent and confess those sins. Secondly, spiritual mourning is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. It's a heartfelt sorrow. There's a difference between admitting that I sin and having a repentant heart. 
after a, major, a major victory in battle in the Old Testament, again, we see an example of this with a king by the name of Saul. He was the first king of Israel. He had disobeyed a direct command of God, taking plunder for himself and for his men, and the king had cheated, deceived, and stole, and then he lied and tried to cover it up. And Saul was found out, his sin was exposed, and this is what, it, when he, this is what he confessed. 1 Samuel chapter 15, this is what he confessed. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Now how many know that sounds really good, doesn't it? I have sinned, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. That's a good place to start. However, look at what follows this. Look what follows this. At first sight, this is what follows, but then something changed in an answer that he gave before Samuel when he was really pressed. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 30, after he's pressed, he says, I have sinned, and then he says to Samuel, yet honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Return with me that I may bow down before the Lord. Notice that Saul admits his sin, but in his heart, he's not truly repentant. He's just trying to do damage control. He's trying to save his reputation. I'm going to tell you that repentance is not damage control. There are times when we might have a sorrow over the fact that we got caught. Sorrow over the fact that our sin was exposed. Sorrow over the fact that we, we feel bad, but not enough to change. Not enough for deep repentance of the heart. Instead, we're worried about our reputation, so we go through the motions and we say, yeah, 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 I messed up, everybody does. Yeah, 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 I got this problem, but you know what? By the grace of Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. Yeah, 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 and over and over and over, we repeat the same things without ever really having a heart that desires to change. And God says that is not godly sorrow. That is not repentance. A heartfelt sorrow is a, single, a signature mark of spiritual mourning. Saul's confession was a manifestation of a worldly sorrow that produces death, different from the godly sorrow of repentance that, that leads to salvation. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, and repentance leads to life. You see, spiritual mourning is the key to overcoming those habitual sins, those sins that we find ourselves caught up in over and over and over again. It is this area for a true believer, a true Christian to say, I don't want, to rep I don't want this over and over, and to have a deep heart of repentance, asking God to bring a change in the, in, inside, a change of heart. You know, we know so little about mourning. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance, not to presumption. To presume upon God's grace is to be a person who is content to sin and assume forgiveness, but does not mourn, does not change. Friends, that's not walking the path of repentance. That's walking the path of presumption. And unfortunately, too many times when we have sin that comes up over and over and over in our lives, we presume upon God's grace, and it's not godly sorrow leading to repentance. There are mercy, there is comfort for those who spiritually mourn. Alexander McLaren said that if you have never been down on your knees before God feeling what a wicked man or woman you are, I doubt hugely whether you will ever stand with a radiant face before God and praise Him through eternity for His mercy upon you. Ouch. Thirdly, spiritual mourning is infused with hope. I want to give you hope this morning. Spiritual mourning is infused with hope. What am I talking about? Because when you begin to see yourself in the place and in light of the holiness of God and you begin to see your weaknesses and you begin to see the areas you fall short, that guilt and that shame can become something that can overwhelm you. That regret can overwhelm you. And if you're not careful, it can lead to a place that God never intended us to go. It can lead to a place of, uh, uh, of great regret. And yet, at the same time, there is hope hope. Let me tell you about the hope. The mourning for your sins and failures is not to lock you up in self-deprecation. Rather, it's to get your eyes on, on and see the foolishness, see the sin, but then get your eyes up on Jesus and begin to see the hope of the cross. Hope is a single uh, signature mark of spiritual mourning, and it arises out of faith, and it is accomplished through the cross of Christ. An example of this would be Judas. Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus, the one who, who came into the garden and betrayed Jesus with a kiss that led to uh, Jesus being seized and, and, and being taken to the cross. 
If you take a look at Judas, Judas was grieved. Judas felt remorse. We, we see that when what had happened, Matthew 27, 3 says that he changed his mind. He changed his mind. He went back in. He took all of the silver coins that he had been given and he wanted to give them back and he threw them over the, the, the temple floor. He was trying to give them back. He was locked with sin and bitter regret, yet he did not look to Christ for forgiveness. And so it grieved him to the place of despair. Spiritual mourning is not to grieve us to a place of despair like Judas. Rather, it is to take us to a place of hope. The grief and the regret and the despair of Judas was not sinful mourning. It was another effect of him being consumed by the devil that had entered his heart. The Holy Spirit never leads us to a place of despair. The Holy Spirit's conviction is not to lead us to a place of despair, but rather it's to lead us to the place of the cross. It's to lead us to the place of hope. It's to lead us to the place where we find comfort and we find mercy and we find grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. This is where there's two sides of the same coin. In spiritual mourning, a believer is sorrowful, yet according to 2 Corinthians 6.10, always rejoicing. Sorrowful because of the offense and the effect of our sin, yet rejoicing because of the hope that we see in Christ Jesus. In fact, Paul gives two great examples of grieving with hope. 1 Timothy 1, 15, this is what he says. He, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners whom I am the worst. This is Paul. This is the writer of most of the New Testament. This is, this is, this is Paul, planter of choices, ch churches. He says, hey, one who is persecuted for his faith. He says, I am the worst of sinners. Let, let, look at verse 16. The next verse down, he says, but for that very reason. How many of you thank God for the but sometimes in Scripture? <laughs> but for that very reason, I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience and example for those who would believe in him him and receive eternal life that's the two sides of the same coin that's the spiritual mourning and the grieving and the recognizing my spiritual poverty before God yet at the same time infused with hope as I see what Christ has done like in Romans chapter 7 where Paul says in verse 24 what a wretched man I am and yet in the next verse in verse 25 he says oh but thanks be to God what a wretched man oh but thanks be to God. You see, when you enter into spiritual mourning, make sure that you have one eye fixed on your sin and the other eye fixed on the cross. Fixed on the cross. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, remembering his grace and his mercy, trusting in the power of his blood to cleanse the worst and most deeply rooted sins. Andrew Bonner, a, a, a godly Scottish pastor, kept an ordinary, insightful, extraordinary, excuse me, insightful journal of his own spiritual life. He had struggled over why he did not hate sin more and why he fell back into some of the same sins and how he couldn't make progress in overcoming them. And one entry in his diary dated May 7th, 1829, this is what he wrote. He said, it has been much impressed upon me that if convinced of sin at all, I must be so by the view of it in Christ's love. In Christ's love. You see, that's where our sin, our sin has to be against the love of Christ. When we see the overarching, amazing love of Christ in the cross, it leads us to confessing our sin and leads us to spiritual mourning. And knowing the love of Christ will take you further. That's why Bonner's experience in his ministry, he helped people turn from their sin by showing them the love of Christ. Pastor Colin Smith, who, who has a, a website called Unlocking the Bible, he once wrote, there's more in looking at the cross than seeing what your sin did to Jesus. The cross is about what Jesus did for you. Amen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So how do we, how do we find that? When we're struggling with the weight of our sin, how do we find that comfort? Well, I think it's found in, in the word spoken by Isaiah about Jesus Christ called the man of sorrows. The man of sorrows. In fact, Isaiah 53 says that, uh, Isaiah says that the Redeemer would be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Centuries before even Christ was born, that's what Isaiah declared. 
Christ knows all about spiritual mourning, not because he mourned over his own sin. He was sinless. He didn't mourn over his own sin, but rather he, he, he mourned over the sins and grieved over the devastating effects of sin in the world and among the very people that he loved. He grieved over those sins. Coming down from the Mount of Olives as he looked over Jerusalem, he wept over the city that did not recognize the destruction that was coming. Writing years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah said what, uh, about this, wor- th- this Redeemer and what his mission would be. The mission would be that of comforting those who mourn. Isaiah 61, 2 and 3, to bestow them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That is what Jesus Christ came to do. And so that's the blessing. The blessing in those who mourn is to find the comfort that we find in the man of sorrows, Jesus Christ. The the one who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, the one who has pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The comfort that we, the blessing is found in the comfort. So when you mourn over your sin and you repent, the blessing is found then in the comfort that you receive from Christ when you experience the true grace and mercy of the Lord. Oh man, I don't know if we're getting this this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lists a catalog of sins. He said some of you were drunkards, some of you were revelers, swindlers, adulterers, adulterers. But he doesn't stop. In 1 Corinthians six eleven, he said, and that is what some of you were. And then here's a but again. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. The spiritual mourner, the one who comes in mourning, experiences the blessing that says, I am forgiven, I am loved, I am cleansed. That's why believers ought to be filled with such joy. That's why believers ought to be filled with much love. Those who have been forgiven much, love much. The problem and the reason that we don't love much is because either we've forgotten or we don't realize how much we need to be forgiven. Therefore, we can't offer forgiveness or grace or love to one another. Sanctification must begin in us. And the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit So let me bring it to a close today. Given the human condition, Jesus promises to comfort those who mourn. And again, this might be counterintuitive, but given the spirit of our age, it couldn't be more relevant today. Sin is not grieved today. Even among those who are Christians, it's not deplored, it's not it's not even merely tolerated, it's celebrated today. In fact, our society doesn't mourn sin, it mourns those who mourn sin. It mourns those who mourn sin, yet we can succumb to similar tendencies, can't we? No doubt we fail to mourn sin because we underestimate it. We assume it's little more than a cosmic parking ticket. But sin is not trivial, it's treason. It's insurrection against heaven's throne. We have never committed a small sin, friends, because we've never offended a, a small God. To the degree in which we mourn over sin, both individually and collectively, we avail ourselves to heaven's comfort, and to the degree we don't, we rob ourselves of it. So let me close with this last illustration this morning. Imagine it's the 4th of July, just about a month ago. Imagine it's the 4th of July. You get a text from your friend that says, I want you to meet me for fireworks. Meet me at 11 a.m. And you're thinking, 11 a.m.? That's a strange time to meet for fireworks. Why? Why would you immediately think 11 a.m.? They must have got it wrong. Why 11 a.m.? Because fireworks are most brilliant when it is most dark. And friends, the comfort and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ is most brilliant when we begin to come and see the darkness of our soul and the forgiveness of the Lord. In fact, the darker the sky, the more stunning the display. In the same way, the brilliance of grace may be set against the blackness of sin. Puritan Thomas Watson said this, and I'm going to leave us with this quote today. Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Friends, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit right now to search your heart. whether you whether you have not believed in Christ whether you've never put your faith in Christ before or whether you have served God for the last 40 to 50 years 
Friends, I want us today to come before the throne of God and to say, Lord, search my heart as David did. Search my heart as David did. Friends, I believe that it is time for us to repent. I believe that it's time for us to come in a spiritual poverty and humility and say, God, I've sinned against you. God, I have nothing to offer you. Father, search my heart. Where in the way in which I live? What is inside of me that is not pleasing to you? Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And to begin to spiritually mourn over our sin that we might experience the comfort of our God. When we allow ourselves to mourn over sin, then we experience the greatest blessing of comfort that comes from receiving the depths of Christ's love and grace. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, right now, whether we're watching it online or whether we're here in person, we ask you right now to search our hearts. We ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to search our hearts. Is there any wickedness inside of us? Is there anything inside of us, God, that is not pleasing to you, whether it be attitude or action or perhaps inaction? Father, whether it be a sin that we have done or a sin in which we have omitted something that we have not done that you have asked us to do. Father, search our hearts right now and bring us to that place, Lord, where we come before you as Isaiah did and we say, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. And it's there at the cross infused with hope that we mourn our sin and that we experience a great comfort from your love. Father, we repent today. I want you to pray a prayer of repentance right now. Let's pray this prayer of repentance, dear Jesus. Forgive us, O God, for we have sinned against you. We ask you, Lord, for your grace. We ask you, Lord, for your mercy. We ask you today for your forgiveness. Wash us clean, O God. Sanctify us, O Lord, and transform us. We repent today, oh God. We repent today. In Jesus' name, amen.